All right, next we have Dr. Pittman's group in the psychology department. Okay, so we did our study on the efficacy of fluorodiazepoxide and clomipramine on anxiety and depression in rat animal models. I'm Parker. I'm Rachel. I'm Sophia. I'm Nora. So before we get into the current study, we're going to go a little bit into the background of our research. So anxiety is categorized as excessive worry in everyday life that causes normal activities such as work, school, or socializing to become distressful, and it consists of a multitude of mental and physical symptoms. There are a variety of anxiety disorders, each with their own unique symptoms and triggers. However, um, the exact cause and why certain individuals are more susceptible to anxiety disorders is not fully understood. Within the U.S., the prevalence is around 20% of adults and 30% of adolescents, and therefore research into medications that relieve the burden on these individuals is extremely important. And then depression is characterized by an individual experiencing five or more symptoms during a two week time period. And some of these symptoms are abnormalities of affect or mood and neurovegetative functions such as sleep or appetite disturbances or cognition and psychomotor activity decline, and the prevalence of developing depression or major depressive disorder is between 10 and 20. So for our current study, we use animal models, which are used in preclinical stages of drug testing because it is unethical and impractical to test new treatments on human subjects before drugs can even enter into the clinical um, trials using humans, they must first be shown to be effective on animals. So there is a large amount of literature on current animal models for both anxiety and depression. However, many of the common methods uh, of testing are very or extremely hard on the rats and induce tremendous stress. Examples of these methods are starvation, angled cages, wet bedding, and sleep deprivation. Therefore, the goal of our current study was to help develop a less harsh method of inducing and testing anxiety and depression on the rats. In order to do this, we chose the elevated plus maze um, to test anxiety, and then we did the four swim test to test depression. And we used the sucrose preference test to determine if depression was induced. These tests are widely recognized um, and what we deem to be the most ethical in our study. Uh, and we also use ultrasonic sound exposure um, as a more ethical way to induce depression, but there is not as much research um, as the other methods we used. So in order to discover these new methods and whether they work, we wanted to use drugs that have been well researched and tested. Um, so for the anxiety portion of our study, we use chlorodiazepoxide, which is a benzodiazepine, and this just works in the brain to affect neurotransmitters, um, with the main target being GABA, which is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. Um, and it targets this one because anxiety is thought to be a result of excessive nerve activity. Um, and then in the depression model, we use clomipramine hydrochloride, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, and this works to block the reuptake of neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine and serotonin in the brain. So as Nora said, we, are, we use the elevated plus maze as our current working model of anxiety. This allows us to examine behavior and exploratory patterns in rats and also see how an open space affects their fear and curiosity. This model in particular often measures how much time the animal spends on the open arms of the maze and how many entrances they take into the closed arms of the maze. We actually built this one right here on Walford's campus. Uh, we made the closed arms and the open arms across from one another, and we had intended to switch the arms into more of an L shape, so it goes from this to more of like this from this. Uh, we had intended to do that to control for habituation to the maze, but we were unable to due to how the arms were constructed. However, we did not find that habituation occurred anyway, even when the plus shape remained the same way. Uh, in this study, we used 22 male sprayed dolly rats, uh, saw one in the previous slide, uh, and we gave half a saline as a control, and the other half we gave three milligrams of the benzodiazepine. 
We allow for about 25 minutes between injection and testing in order to let the drug take full effect. When the rats were put into the maze, they were put in with their heads facing one of the open arms, and then they were allowed two minutes of exploratory time, immediately followed by seven minutes of testing time, all of which was recorded and then later analyzed. So our results, based on the elevated plus maze portion of this experiment, showed that there was a decrease in anxiety behaviors, namely that rats given the drug treatment um, had an increased time spent on open arms as well as increased number of entries. However, neither of these measurements were significant, and one reason this might be the case is due to our sample size, um, which meant that individual variants between the rats impacted the overall significant outcome. And this can be shown more in depth with this graph, which measures, measures percent change um, from saline to the drug treatment. And when we take this into account, we see that there was a 200% increase for time spent on open arms and a 150% increase for the number of entries, which just goes to show that um, if we measure or if we um, include individual invariants, then we do have more notable effects. And then our working model of depression is the force swim test, where we had rats in a five gallon bucket or a large trash can, um, or where they swam for two minutes of test or two minutes of baseline and six minutes of testing time. We used a five gallon bucket or this trash can so their tails couldn't touch the bottom and so they couldn't jump out, so they had to swim the whole time. Um, when they were swimming, the time of immobility was what we were measuring, which is the time they weren't actively swimming or trying to escape. And so this included time they were floating or time when they sank to the bottom. Um, we used um, the drug um, clomipramine, where we gave a high dosage of 50 milligrams per milliliter per rat body weight. We gave this drug for six days before we discontinued due to a 6% more, 6 morbidity rate in the rats. Um, and at the same time, we had an ultrasonic exposure that was at 44 kilohertz that we gave for 21 days, and we continued it for the full 21 days. So the time of immobility was measured in the pretest, which is before the depressive phase, and the post-test, which was after the depressive phase. And looking at the depression test, after 21 days of exposure to the ultrasonic sound, there was an, there was an increase in their time spent immobile in the post-test, but it did not reach um, significance. This could be due to variability of mask effect, or the use of our short test of only eight minutes because other literature um, used 30 minutes to an hour, but we found that, that it would be more ethical to use a shorter amount of time. Uh, the sucrose preference test is what we used as our determination for depression. So the amount of sucrose water that is consumed compared to regular water is an indicator of whether or not these animals are seeking out a pleasurable experience. This is because it has been shown that the consuming sucrose is uh, direct, is related to the uh, inf is or sorry it influences the dopamine signaling and like the pleasure center of your brain. So the more or the less sugar that they consumed, the more likely there was an effect of depression on the rats themselves. Um, we gave each rat during the 21 day ultrasonic exposure. We gave uh, each rat one bottle of regular water and one bottle of sucrose water for a 12 hour period. At the six hour mark, the bottles were switched to control for place preference, and we weighed and measured the bottles before and after. Um, we actually did this uh, last semester as well, and we used about 1% of sucrose per bottle for each rat, and we didn't really find anything there. There was no significant preference, so we assumed that it was because the sucrose solution wasn't as potent with only 1% of sucrose in the bottle. So this semester, we brought it up to 2.5% of sucrose per, uh, per bottle. And we had all the rats during the 21 day period, they were exposed to a ultrasonic exposure from this one machine. So this was our room exposure. Um, and this was with the 2.5%. We found something in the, it was big in the pretest, but not so much in the post. And so we ended up, when we were using this machine after our testing, we took this to the physics department, actually, and we ran some tests. And we found out that the effect of this ultrasonic machine may not have been as big as we thought it was. We assumed that it was bouncing around the room and it was bathing the room in sound when it seems like it wasn't even penetrating the cages. So for our second test, 
we switch to individual things, individual ultrasonic devices installed above each cage. So there was a more direct exposure that the rats were having. And we also took down our sucrose solution to about 1.75% instead of the 2.5. Um, and so this is the results for just the water test, which was the control to see if they had um, any difference in the consumption of water pre and post. And there wasn't really a difference, which is what we expected, since it's just water. Um, but this was our results for the sucrose. We started with the 2.5% with the um, full room exposure. And we did see a decrease in the um, preference for sucrose, but it wasn't significant. And we're not sure if it's because the sucrose was too sweet or because of the full room exposure. But in the sucrose 1.75%, we found a significant decrease in the sucrose preference in the post-test. But again, we're not sure if it's from the change in sucrose or if, since we also changed to um, individual cage um, ultrasonic exposure at the same time. So now that we've discussed the specifics of the current study, we're going to talk about um, why our results were not what we expected. Um, so one major limitation in the anxiety model is that um, rats may need to be naive to the maze in order to experience high enough anxiety levels to produce a significant outcome. Um, this did not happen in the current um, study. As Rachel said, our models were not able to move the legs and therefore we couldn't change the formation and so rats were familiar with the maze during the second round of testing. Um, but one way to get around this would be to either build a new model that does have that ability or to use an open field test, um, which is another common animal model. Um, used in anxiety experiments. And then as I had kind of previous touched, previously touched on, um, another limitation is the individual variants that we saw. And so in future experiments, it might be helpful to increase that sample size so that more significant outcomes um, can happen. And then for the depression model, our limitations, we saw that um, in the four swim tests, we only used eight minutes of testing time, like Nora said. But literature has gone from 15 minutes to 30 to up to two hours of testing time. And they vary how much time um, but they swim each um, testing time. And so going back in the literature and determining maybe a longer testing time so that they can get used to swimming and then we can measure the time for the mobility might be important. Um, along with what I was just mentioning about the ultrasonic sound exposure, we changed both from full room to individual cage um, ultrasonic exposure at the same time that we changed the sucrose concentrations. So we're not sure which one had the effect, and in the future they should stick to the single cage ones, but alter the sucrose concentrations until they can find um, a good effect. And we also had the issue of the morbid morbidity of our rats. Um, so we discontinued our drug at 6% morbidity. Um, we used a high dose of our drug, but it's not the highest that was found in the literature. It was kind of a medium, and so, um, we're not sure why we had our results that we did with rats dying, but other studies don't report it until they get to 50%, and we just thought it was unethical to continue if our rats were dying. Um, before we go to questions, we just wanted to give a special thanks to the Wofford Technology Department and Dr. Pittman for supervising our research this semester. This is such a cool, this is really, really cool research. Uh, I have a question, and Dr. Pittman, this may uh, be for you. So in the anxiety model, epoxide is a longer acting uh, um, benzodiazepine, correct? Mm. And I wonder if, so maybe y'all can speak to this, why, why uh, that versus something a shorter acting like, uh, like, like Xanax? Because I'm thinking, you know, in terms of the effect, people don't abuse Librium. They abuse Xanax because of the fast acting, and maybe that that potency has something to do with the impact. Um, well, the clomipramine, which was the depressive one, which was the, that was the one that had the adverse effect. But we chose um, the chlordiazepoxide for the anxiety model just because of how well researched it was, and our goal wasn't necessarily to test the efficacy of the drug we were using, but specifically the efficacy of like the model we were using. Um, but in future research, because we didn't see significant results, that might also be something to try. Yes. So, in your animal model for depression, you're, you're, you guys use about eight minutes, and you said you stopped because they what, they sank to the bottom? Sometimes. So, um, so, I've seen this model before, and what they do, like that's how they get like an hour or two hours, they use water wings. 
they put little water, they put little balloons under their arms, and so they're swimming around, and then when they stop, they just sit there and float. <laughs> At the end of our study, they got really fat. So they were, they were floating anyway. cylinder that's transparent, it's used it's, it's plexiglass basically, and they have about two to three feet of water. And then they can drop, like if they wanted to, they could drop transparent sort of like blocks into the water so that the rats could step on it if they needed to. But it's basically a learned helplessness paradigm because rats hate water so they're going to swim and swim and swim until they realize they can't get out and then they just stop. And that's why, the, that's why they have the, the little water wings. That's cute. Dr. Pittman, get on that. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. I don't know much about psychology, but I'm wondering, could you comment on how you define depression in rats and why you expect that to translate well onto humans? Um, we, I guess that's one of the challenges of experiments like this because it's extremely hard to replicate such complex behaviors in animal models. Um, but we chose these, like the elevated plus maze and then um, the other models specifically because they've been well researched as showing depression or a measurement of anxiety and depression. Um, and also just like very specific behaviors as well. It's easy to uh, examine rats because they're not as complex as, as the human brain and also it's uh, making de humans depressed on purpose. Is, Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's, they have more observable behaviors in terms of like their body language and how and very more obvious changes from prior to any drugs post or prior to testing, post testing. So when using animals, it's just something that it's more easily documented and it's more well researched. But like I said, it is challenging and mm -hmm. that was a challenge in our experiment because we did it successfully um, induce depression mm -hmm. as far as we could see in our models. All right, thank you.